and I'm looking forward to what the Holy Spirit's going to do because I've been uh, looking at some things over time and, and wondering what God wanted to do with them. And I'm just going to grab a little tiny piece of, of the whole today. And that is that uh, the word therefore has been capturing my attention when I've gone through the Bible. And it's shown up so many times that it it's, must be there for a reason. And so in, in looking at that, I thought, and I like to do word studies. I don't know why. It kind of, seems like kind of an odd thing. But I like to look at words and figure out where they came from and, and why they are, where they are. And so we're going to get into that today a little bit. And we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 6. So if you want to turn there, if you don't have a Bible, we have some Bibles around the room as well. You can grab one and uh, be comfortable to do that because I'm going to spend a few minutes before we get into the Word. You, I want you to just keep your fingers there and we will uh, get to that after we go through some other things that aren't quite as important, but will help settle you down a little bit. Or me, maybe, settle me down a little bit. Or maybe not. We'll see what happens. So, how many of you have ever given advice? How many of you have ever received advice? How many of you have ever received it gladly? Well, okay, maybe. So advice is something that's part of our, our, our living. It's part of being here on the earth. We look for people who are wise to give us things to help us make, to, to miss those opportunities of making mistakes. Um, but often we find that Making mistakes is the thing that teaches us. But Paul's giving advice in the Galatians. And other advice has been given throughout time. And I'd like to go through two different examples of advice that has been given, continues to be given, and is of some possible usefulness if you are creative enough. First is advice to cowboys. Now... Cowboy is a, that's an interesting term for me because most cowboys don't even hardly know what a cow is. They just, they just ride horses. Don't they call them horse boys? But I, I don't know. But advice to cowboys. Some of these you've heard before and some of them may be new to you. Some of them you wish you'd never heard before or wouldn't have heard today. First of all, don't squat with your spurs on. <laughs> See, so... That's one you're familiar with. It's a good piece of advice. <laughs> Secondly, don't let your yearnings get ahead of your earnings. <laughs> kind of cutesy cowboy, but really deep. Thirdly, don't dig for water under the outhouse. <laughs> now, I lived in Sweden for a time, and I had a house on what used to be an island, it was now a peninsula because the ocean levels had changed. And that house was one of few in this community that had plumbing. Um, the rest of the houses were, for, were garden homes. So they were out, people went out there and they raised their gardens and then they had a primary home somewhere else. And I was leading a team at a, doing some work in, in southern Sweden and we had this house as the team house. And it had running water and it had a septic tank. And we had a problem with the water because it had, when you washed clothes, the clothes came out brown. So I had the water inspected. It's okay. Even though the water was taken out of the ground about four feet from the septic tank. So <clears throat> that is uh, wise advice. <laughs> don't go in if you don't know how to get out. Don't mess with something that ain't bothering you. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but that's one trap I fall into too much. Never corner something meaner than you. <laughs> Never drive black cattle in the dark. <laughs> Never approach a bull from the front, a horse from the rear, a 
or a fool from any side. <laughs> Never ask how stupid someone is because they'll turn around and show you. <laughs> Never ask a barber if you need a haircut. <laughs> and this one is special. Never slap a man chewing tobacco. <laughs> All right, so my biggest fear in presenting these to you is that these are the things you'll remember, and you won't remember the scriptural <laughs> things. So take those and just say, oh, that was a cute, those are cute, that's kind of a nice little laugh, way to get started. Throw them away, okay? Now I'd like to introduce you just briefly to a book that I just finished reading. I wish I could say just finished writing, but it's written by Erwin Lutzer. Who knows Erwin Lutzer? Oh, a few of you. He's the pastor emeritus, which means he used to once be, but isn't now, the senior pastor of Moody Bible Church in Chicago. So you've heard of Moody Bible Church, you know about it, and... and uh, first pastor, I think, was probably Dwight L. Moody. So he wrote this book, and it was written last year. It's called We Will Not Be Silenced. And it really talks about the changes in America that have happened recently. And it's talking about what I will consider to be the end times. Not for the world, but for America. I personally believe that America, as we know it, is in its end times. So he writes about this, but he continually refers back to the church's responsibility. And so his advice in here is, number one, wake up, strengthen what remains. That's right out of Revelations. That's uh, Jesus' message. And then he says also, the problem is that they no longer saw the world of sin as an enemy. This is a problem in the church today, is the church in general does not see sin as its enemy, and it has crept in in so many places. Now, I'd like to think it doesn't happen here. Probably not, but you could. If it applies, take it. Be resolved to be, a gospel, to be gospel driven in your life and witness. So don't be driven by the whims of uh, some preacher or some theologian or some philosopher that you hear. Be driven by God's word and how you live and how you witness. Be resolved that you will not bow to the culture's sexual revolution. We don't even want to talk about this. But the fact is that, and we're all adults, right? Sexual activities have become accepted even within the church that are not allowed by God. And we can't fall to that. We need to, we need to say no. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Again, right out of the Bible. So many people want to deceive us with empty words. And they don't know if they intentionally deceive us or if they're deceiving us because they're deceived. But the fact is that it's out there and it's happening. Okay. Be resolved to love me, Jesus, passionately and suffer well for my name, for Jesus' name. This is a time when, ladies and gentlemen, it's more likely that we're going to suffer for our faith than it ever has been before in America. There's a, and I didn't read the whole article, but a pastor in Canada has been arrested for teaching the gospel. Now, I believe he touched on the topic of, um, of the sexual behavior that God does not allow. And for that, he was punished and is in, is in jail today as a result. So we need to be careful. We need to be careful. And we must have the courage to engage the culture and stand against it. That means that we have to be aware of what's going on around us. We have to know that there are cultural things happening that are very strange to us as believers in Jesus Christ. And yet we have, to, we have to step aside from it, not be part of it. So those are two pieces of advice being given, one to cowboys and one to the church. And one to the church, I'm through with the book. If anybody wants to borrow it, that's great, but you're welcome to do that. Okay, Bob. Um, so you can take a look at that. So Galatians chapter 1 through 6. We're not going to cover the whole book today. We're going to be looking mostly at chapter 6, but I'm going to give you an intro that is... Um, a little extensive, 
And then we'll get into chapter 6 where we get to the therefore. So the background of these folks and the, the people that Paul is writing to, we know these are the Galatians. Jay has always been very careful to keep us in tune with what things were like at the time when the scriptures are written. You know, it's important for us to, to remember that these, that these words that we read in God's word were written to people 2,000 years ago. Their culture and the timing resulted in them maybe being able to understand things a whole lot better than sometimes we can today. So I've thought recently about, for example, the, the story that's told about the, the, the wide road and the narrow road or the wide gate and the narrow gate. And we know that uh, we as believers are the ones that go through the narrow and that the whole bunch of people go through the wide gate down the wide road. And, and, and I'm still studying this. I'm not sure what the answer is. But I bet there's something culturally that caught their attention when it said that. So for example, a wide doorway or a gate in that time would have been the, the entrance to a city. And a narrow one would have been going into a private home or into a business. So they would have related these things to something that was culturally sensitive and important to them. So we look at these people, and, and I, I used as a reference a, a reference that I don't recommend to you. Interesting, huh? The reference is called BibleOdyssey.org. Anybody seen that on the internet? Okay. All right. Let me suggest to you, don't. It is, it is not conservative, biblically based in general. But what they did was a, a good write-up regarding the culture of the time, which they're big on culture, but not big on theology. So it uh, does say accurately that Galatia was in the highlands of central, central Anatolia. Now, you've all been there, right? It's, it's right over from Fresno. No, it's, it's in the middle of Turkey. And um, this province was named Galatia or Galicia in its time uh, as a nod to its population history because the people that came and settled there were Thracian Gauls. Now, you know what Gaul is? French, French, French or German. French or German or even Spanish. And, uh, but they were actually Celts. Celt is a strange word to me. It's spelled with a C, right? C-E-L-T. <laughs> How do you do that? So, uh, but, but Celt, K-E-L-T. No, C-E-L-T is how it's spelled. And uh, they are the people that came down. And you can, you can look at their character and see where, where we're going to go here. They invaded Macedonia. They were a warring people, came down, took over Macedonia, and when they got bored with that, then they moved over to the middle of Turkey. In about the third century BC, this happened. So by the time Paul was writing, by the time Jesus was on the earth, they had been settled there for some time. Now, Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, this is a famous writing of, of times past, depicts these people as pale skinned with red hair. Some of you might have been that way at one point in time. Some of you maybe today, artificially, <laughs> I don't know. With wild eyes. Wild eyes. Can you imagine? Julius Caesar, he was from Southern Europe. He probably had what color eyes? Brown. brown. Probably brown eyed. And here come these Celts from Northern Europe who had blue eyes. They must have looked wild to anybody. Some portion of you have blue eyes, some of you are green, some of you have brown eyes. I thought for most of my life, until two years ago when I was renewing my driver's license, that I had hazel eyes. I didn't know what hazel was, but it sounded cool to me. So that was on my driver's license for 50 years or something like that. Until I looked in the mirror one day and realized I have blue eyes. And uh, they're not deep blue and they're not blue-green, and they're not whatever, but they're blue. So I bet Julius Caesar would have looked at my eyes and said, I had wild eyes. They got to look really weird to somebody who's never seen blue eyes before. And you know that most of the people in the world don't have blue eyes. It's just those strange Northern Europeans who do. They were extremely muscular and strong people, both the male and the female. Interesting that he would record that. The females must have been able to demonstrate their strength, their physical strength somehow in what he <coughs> observed. They were marauding and greedy for material wealth. It's 
Sounds American. I mean, they were uh, ferociously unruly in battle. Now, battle back in those days was a very structured activity. You had lines of, of uh, soldiers who moved forward, and as one line got destroyed, then the next line moved forward. Everything was done in a very particular way. You had to follow the rules of war. Well, today we know that we don't do that anymore. But today we, we maraud and we raid and we do things where we, you don't know where the battlefront is, you don't know where the lines of battle are. So things have changed very much. They were outlandishly boundary ignorant. <laughs> Interesting term. So they didn't have any corner posts on their property and they would do many things in life that didn't follow the standards. Obviously, when we talked about war, that's one. The other thing is they, they preferred to wear pants instead of tunics. That must have been scandalous, can you imagine? Well, the current Turkish city of Ankara is in the middle of the land that was Galicia at the time. Anybody been to Ankara? Okay, one of you has, and I've been there as well. Um, and I have some memories of Ankara that are strange. So, um, well, I'll tell you one of them. But anyway, um, I was climbing in Eastern Turkey and coming back, uh, I needed to catch an airplane and get out of the country. I, was, I ran out of time. So I quickly went to Ankara, caught a plane to, to Istanbul and then flew back to America. And in Ankara, I was getting on the airplane. I've been climbing, mind you, okay? And so I was waiting in line and the inspector was asking me the questions they have to ask. You know, are you carrying anything that's been given to you by someone else? Uh, have, have you done this? Have you done that? So forth. Are you, are you carrying anything that might be considered to be a weapon? I said, well, I don't know. What about this <laughs> ice axe? His eyes got as big as saucers. <laughs> and you know what his advice was? Well, when you get on the airplane, make sure to put it in the overhead bin. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't recently, mind you. <laughs> that was in the, uh, that was in 1990. So, um, strange, strange, anyway. Ankara, it's the political capital of Turkey today. So if you've, if you've been there, if you've heard of it, it is where all of the politics takes place. So we know more about Istanbul because it's so famous, but it, it's not the political capital. Well, Paul actually visited Galatia twice. First time in his first missionary journey, and that's recorded in Acts chapter 16. And the second time on his second journey is recorded in Acts chapter 18. So you can see those if, when you're reading through Acts and Jay's been taking us through Acts and you, there's just, he gives us just so much information. You may not be able to remember that far back, but in those chapters when he's, he's presenting that, Galicia was an important place for him to go through. He taught them to give, and that's recorded in actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. He's telling the Corinthians that, hey, the Galatians know how to give. How about you guys? Crescens, who was one of Paul's disciples, was with him on the journey and decided he had enough, and he went home to Galatia. And then Peter wrote to the Galatians, and that's recorded in 1 Peter chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1 and verses 6 and 7, Paul rebukes the Galatians. He says that they've turned away to a different gospel. Interesting idea. We think about the gospel, and we think we have the gospel pretty well figured out. They were being taught a different gospel. We're going to look at a little bit at that today and why that's important when Paul's writing to them and giving them his advice. But then in, um, he defended the, the true gospel beginning in the next verse, verse 8, and went on through the end of the chapter. In chapter 4, he showed concern for them. In chapter 5, he showed confidence in them. And then chapter 6 is where we're going to be today. Some of the Jews had scattered to Galatia from Israel. So Galatia was a combination. It was a land like many of the lands where Paul has visited in his writing where there are Jews and Gentiles together. And so he, he writes to them. They are settled mostly in the southern portions of the country. They haven't gone all over. Galatia is a pretty big province at the time. And uh, today it doesn't exist. Today it's, it's not considered Galatia at all. So um, it was um, where Paul visited on his journeys. We know he went to... Um, 
Derby, and do you remember the other city that he was in? Lystra. So he was known to those cities that were in Galatia at the time. So the book itself, Paul wrote, as we know, but we don't know when he wrote it, nor do we know where he wrote it from. There's some people who can make some guesses. But uh, he, he wrote it to those whom he had presented the gospel and disciples. So he's writing it to them to encourage them, to rebuke them if necessary, and to remind them, to give them advice on how to live a good Christian life. Some theologians think he might have actually written to the people all over the entire province of Galicia. I don't see any basis for that. I think it's got to be written to the places where he planted churches or where churches might have grown out of those churches. You know what happens many times is a church is planted and then uh, there are daughter churches that take for, go forward from that. So I'm in communication with um, a pastor and his wife who are in Amsterdam in, in um, the Netherlands. What else, what else is in the Netherlands called? Anybody know? Holland. Holland. Okay. Some of you have Netherlandish ancestry. I can remember. And uh, so they are there, and actually Gail and Max and Judy and I visited their church one time about six years ago, maybe. It's, time passes. And they now actually have daughter churches that have formed out of them. So we know that it's possible that in Galicia that those churches where Paul visited and where he preached actually then presented the gospel to other people in other churches for We don't know, but it's very possible that that happened. The key parts of the book include both first chapter one, as you might guess, is the defense of the true established gospel. What is the true established gospel? It's a gospel of grace, gospel that is based on faith in Jesus Christ. It's not a gospel of the law. Although the law doesn't go away, the law is not the good news. The law is actually the bad news. So it's the thing that we need to, to stay away from. Chapter 2 through 4 are freedom from the law. Makes sense. It follows very naturally from that. Chapter 5 presents to us the fruit of the Spirit. And we'll look a little bit back at that. And chapter 6 ties it all together. So we're going to be in chapter 6, as I mentioned. Memorable verses throughout the book. First is chapter 2, verse 20. Some of you may even have memorized this verse. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So praise God that we are crucified in Christ. That sounds like a, we have to die. We do, the flesh has to die in our lives. Now the flesh isn't physical flesh. It is the, the desires of the flesh that have to die. 5.13, for you have been called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. It's easy, and some people do this. They just say, well, we don't have to follow the law anymore. We just, God, God loves us, and it's all about love. But God is a righteous, holy God. And that's what many churches have tended to forget, in, mostly in more recent years, that he is a God of righteousness. Righteousness, not just love. It's because of his love that he saves us. Because it's, it's also because of his righteousness that he saves us. Because otherwise we couldn't stand in his presence. And then chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Many of you again have these memorized. These are what are called the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such things, there is no law. Again, he brings the law back in because he's dealing with people. Galatians have been influenced by, we call Judaizers. These are Jewish people who've come in and said, if you want to be a Christian, you must first be a Jew. You must look like a Jew, act like a Jew, walk like a Jew, quack like a Jew. And so because of this, then he's having to say, hey, this is a faith that is built on the grace of God. So the word therefore, as I mentioned earlier, is one that's been fascinating me. And it is, it's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It actually shows up 1,200 or more times in the Bible. 500 of those times are in the New Testament. 
And so in the New Testament, New Testament was written in what language? Greek. Greek. And a little bit in Aramaic, I think, as well. So written in Greek, we see it there. And so the Greek word that this all comes from is spelled roughly in English, O-U-V. And I don't know Greek, so it's all Greek to me. But it's not always translated as therefore. So you'll see some of you have, we have varying translations. I brought with me today my, my New King James translation. And, um, and I, I study often uh, in, in the uh, English Standard Version. And I also use for studying purposes often the New American Standard Version. So and some, love, a lot of you love the, the NIV. So there are lots of different versions out there that, that uh, attempt to accurately depict what was written in the original languages. But in this case, for therefore, in the uh, English Standard Version, in the verse we're going to go to in, in chapter 6, verse 10, eventually, it says, so then, it doesn't say therefore, but in the New King James, it says, therefore. So it's, it shows up differently, but it can be translated as so, or then, or both, accordingly, consequently, or these things being so. And it's really a conjunction. It goes between an argument and a conclusion. It goes between data and a direction. So it's telling us this is what things are like and this is what you should do about it. So that's why it becomes very important to us. And I know Jay has talked to us about it and he's mentioned that when you see the word therefore, you should do what? Yeah, ask what it's there for. So that's what we're doing. So that's the introduction, ladies and gentlemen. You've survived the introduction. It's time to go to the actual study. So we're going to look at chapter 6, verse 1. The first, six, first five verses of the chapter could be titled, Bear and Share. Bear and Share. So verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken by any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. So he's talking about a situation where some brother or sister in Christ has strayed from the truth or they're committing sin of some kind and they need correction. They need advice. They need you to come alongside them. And here he says the first thing you should do is be gentle. Don't just be overlording this on them. Just say, you don't go up to them and say, you jerk, you just really messed up. You need to go to them and say, you know, I'd like to pray for you. I noticed some things in your life I'm concerned about. And I'm not telling you these are the words you should use, but it's the attitude in what we say that's important. Be gentle in how you deal with them. Most people, when they have strayed from the truth or they're living in sin, aren't eager to have your advice. They need it. So it's important that we go to them with the right attitude. And he also says in here that we shouldn't be sucked into their temptation. Don't become a victim when you see somebody doing this. So for that, and, and I don't know that you would agree with me on this, but for example, if, if we knew that somebody from our fellowship was sitting up at Lance's right now, enjoying a brew, and they hit, were an alcoholic, for example, okay, and, and having a brew would be just really wrong for them, should we all go up there as a church and sit down with them in the bar and preach the gospel to them? Amen. Well, there's one. Okay. <laughs> so we'll assign Jim to go up and do that. If you are also a person who is, has problems with alcohol, excessive consumption of alcohol, then you ought not to go there and do that because you might get sucked into that temptation. So we need to be careful when we're giving advice just to watch out. You remember that you've heard this thing before, the thing about when you point a finger at somebody, three fingers point back at yourself. So we need to be careful when we're doing this anyways. We need to be careful to judge people. We need to be careful that what we're giving advice for is truly something from God, not something from our own little personal little vendetta. Verse two, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Just a short little verse. Bear one another's burdens. Well, what this says is that the, the walk in Jesus Christ is not all about us as individuals. It's about a corporate experience. You know, we like to, so often as Americans, we are 
we're pioneers. We're on the edge. We're on the on the forefront of society. My, my, uh, well, let's see if I can figure this out. My grandfather, great grandfather, was born in what used to be Virginia. Today, if it's not Virginia, it would be West Virginia. He moved his family to Arkansas. They moved their family to Arizona, and then they moved to California. So I'm a third generation Californian, which is pretty strange. Most, most of you are not. But, um, and, and actually my dad was born in Arizona, but he wasn't born in the state of Arizona. Arizona Territory, Arizona Territory just before it became a state. So um, now you know more about me than I know that, that uh, we're all pioneers. We tend to just to launch off and, and take care of ourselves and we don't pay a whole lot of attention to the needs of other people. But in Jesus Christ, we need to be not just individuals who seek after him, but we need to seek after him as a corporation. Not, I'm not talking about a business corporation. I'm talking about a group of people who works together. So the Christian walk isn't just individual. It's also together. The, the work that happens in that case is that the weaker person takes care of the stronger person. Some of us are strong in some areas and weak in others. And we're... And others are strong in areas that we're weak in. So we need to help each other and work with each other to work through issues. Verse 3. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. This would never happen to me. I am above this. An accurate self-image is what he's saying that we should have here. It is really easy to see ourselves with a higher opinion than is real. It's really easy to see ourselves with a higher opinion than others see us. And so we need to be very careful to make sure our opinion of ourselves and the way we present ourselves is accurate. So it says we should be humble. But we know that some people are so humble that they become proud of being humble. <laughs> so make sure that your self-image is accurate and that you present yourself well. Verse 4, but let each one examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Telling us to examine ourselves. It's kind of a theme throughout these few verses. The thing that, that hit me in this is that in the business world, you see this where everybody works together to accomplish a purpose and then one person takes the credit. Have you seen that happen? I have. And what's that? Corporate America. Corporate America. Yeah. And, and this can happen in the church as well. You know, if the senior pastor stood up here and said, it's all about me, which Jay does not do, he would be absolutely wrong because all of us are part of his team. You may be part of his team because you, you give to, so the church can afford to pay his salary. It may be because you pray for him. It may be because you encourage him or even rebuke him when he needs a rebuke. But we're all part of the activity together. And he cannot stand alone. He only stands with all of us working together with him. Verse 5. For each one shall bear his own load. Interesting that he says this now because he just told us to bear one another's burdens a few verses back. And now he says we should bear our own load. Well, this basically is concerned because we have an, a tendency to give up and let somebody else do it for us. Not all of us. Some of us are the ones who are out front and doing everything and, and wondering where, what happened to all the people who were supposed to be following us. But we need to make sure that we don't expect someone else to do our part. We need to do our own part. So you all are members of the body of Christ, at least as far as I know. So if you're a member of the body of Christ, then every member of the body has a function, even the little toe. If you're a little toe, God bless you. Glad you have your function. The next verses can be titled, Give and Do Good. And this is verses 6 through 10 roughly. And so as we look at those, verse 6 says, 
Let him who has who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Now this is a self-serving verse, which what I say, you need to give to the pastors in your church because they don't have other jobs. Now, personally, that's not the case because I don't happen to be on salary, but there are, there are pastors who, I mean, they've given their lives to teaching you. They've given their lives to presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as they do that, then we need to support them. We're part of their sport team. <coughs> and you should give to the ones who teach the truth. Now, if you were in a fellowship where the truth was not taught, you shouldn't be giving to that fellowship. If you know of things happening in this world where the truth is not taught, and yet they're asking for your money, be very careful how you give. It's okay to support worthy causes. You know, there may be some of them out there that you support. I support a few missionaries, for example, and, and in doing that, um, I know that they are presenting God's word. They're doing things that are useful in the kingdom of God. But we need to be careful and, and do that well. And don't just give randomly to any old organization or necess even necessarily one that is strictly humanitarian. There are some good humanitarian organizations. Just be careful when you do it. But your primary giving opinion, not necessarily scriptural, is to your home church. And if you want to work through your home church to serve some of these other organizations, I think you can set that up. So for example, this church supports Pastor Stephen, who is in North, northern Kenya, and uh, he's a, a very poor man who is only able to survive because of the giving of people outside his country. And he's doing an amazing job of, present, of, of sharing the gospel, of planting daughter churches. He's the senior pastor of Calvary Chapel in Maralal in northern Kenya. He's planted a church in Poro, in Marti, in Morijo, in Baragoe, in... Um, Logatai, and in Langima. And then that's in the last three years. And these are little fellowships that are way out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, there's no water, but there's the gospel. And so we, we see that that's an effort that we know. It's been tried, it's been proven, it's been shown that it's effective. I've been there a couple times. Jay has uh, met with Stephen and, and, uh, and been one of his teachers over time. And so we know that that's a function that we can work with. And we can work through the local church to do that. If you know of missionaries or of organizations that can use your support and uh, you want to work through the local church, I would, I would highly advise that. Verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap correction. Corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit, it will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So sowing and reaping. Some of you have been uh, farm people. Um, I've planted a garden once or twice. I grew up in a lemon ranch where we didn't sow anything. We just reaped. Somebody else sowed a long time before. So I have a little tiny flavor of what it's like. But the... The fact is that you sow what you reap. So whatever you put in the ground generally dies and then it comes back up as something that is useful. Good works have good results. We don't always see them. And that's disappointing sometimes. But the good results will come at least in eternity, ultimately. Sometimes they return quickly, but sometimes... Not at all. It might not even be seen in your lifetime. Verse 9. In due, in due season we shall reap it if we do not lose heart. I think I left a line out. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. He's telling us not to tire of doing good. This is something that, that can be a, a, an issue. And I look at you know, Max and Gail in the food closet, for example, if I can pick on them, where this is an effort they've been doing now for how many years? 21 years. And can you imagine? They're, they deal with people who are 
Not necessarily the people you want to live in the house next to you. There are folks who come to the food closet, some of them who don't really even deserve what they get. They, they come because they know they're getting a free handout or they meet, get to meet some other friends. And yet, if, if they had become tired, stop it, they'd become tired of doing this ministry, then it would have fallen on uh, uh, far away. And today that food closet is richer and stronger and better spiritually than it ever has been. You know, Pastor Jim gets to go out there, pray with the people and present the gospel and present good news to them and, and pray with individuals when they have prayer needs. And so we have things happening out there that are, that are amazing in the, in the community of Christ. Yes, we're giving away food, but we're also giving away the good news of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. So what a, what a way to do a ministry. Don't become tired of doing these kind of things. I can imagine what it might be like. At, uh, and I served in the food closet for a time before I became a pastor. And if you, if you got up in that morning, you said, oh, I'm just going to go out there and deal with things that I don't want to deal with today. I think I'll just not go. That's becoming tired of doing good. And so we need to be careful to do good work where good needs to be done. And you're not all called to work in the food closet, incidentally. It's not a, this isn't a commercial. Okay, it might be. This isn't, this isn't a, intended to be a commercial. But it's whether you receive results or rewards. Now, the results are in their people, the people that you're giving to. And the rewards are for you, okay? So you may not see either of those in your lifetime. And if you don't see the rewards for you, maybe that's even better because you're going to get them in heaven. And that's going to be cool, much cooler. Then in verse 10 is where my therefore comes in. Let's see if it shows up in this translation. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So we're just to do good to all. Why? Seems like a, it's a great platitude, great philosophy, but why? Why should we do, be doing good for all people? Number one, because we are the body of Christ, Christ who died for our sins, who gave his life for us. What less should be expected of us than to give our lives, not literally, but figuratively, give our lives to the world, to those who are in need. We give also because we are humble, and I would say humble servants. We're not, we don't think so highly of ourselves that we say, yeah, I'm, I'm better than this. The only thing that makes us better than anything is Jesus Christ. We're going to do good to all because we pull our own weight. We, we, we want to do our part in the body. If you're that little toe, you do what the little toe does. You know, if you're the eyeball, you do what the eye does. Whatever it is that is the function, and we know those are, those are figurative terms, and we all have a function in the body, whether it be giving or praying or teaching or, or uh, encouraging or rebuking or whatever it might be, you have a, you have a role in the body of Christ. And as you do it, we just do it because we're pulling our own weight. And then fourthly, we do it because we take care of our Bible teachers. And we talked about that earlier. That these are things that are reflected from the earlier verses. We want to take care of those who are teachers. What will be the result of our then doing good for all people and especially those in the body of Christ? There will be positive result of our efforts. Can you see it? If we work together as a body of Christ, as we work to work individually as as believers in Jesus Christ, what do non-believers see? They see something that is intriguing at least, if not attractive, and draws them into the walk in Christ. They want what you want what you have. I don't know how many of you have ever had the experience where somebody's come up to you and said, There's something about you. I don't know what it is. I like it. I want to be like that. I used to have people come up to me at at times and say, why are you smiling? Why are you smiling? And I didn't give them a direct answer and say, because Jesus lives within my soul. (laughs) I guess I could have done that. Maybe it would have been better. I don't know. But they came back again and asked him because they were looking for whatever it was. That, that drove me to be 
different to them, something that seemed attractive to them, at least intriguing to them. And I bet all of you have had experiences similar to this. So we need to be attractive to those who are not part of the body of Christ. The next verse, which is verse 11, I'm going to read to you, but it's a greeting and it's not anything that I want to get into detail on. It says, see with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. So Paul is closing out the letter. Often Paul used a scribe to, to scribe to write out the letters and he put a closing statement on the end. And that's what he's doing here. And he says, with big letters. And I don't know why he said big letters necessarily. People have had lots of thoughts about why he would have done this. Some people think because he was, he was half blind and he had to write big to see what he wrote. Uh, I don't know that we really know the answer but he was writing the big letters. And so that's just the greeting that's in there. Then the next verses I entitled glory and go. Glory and go. This is the, what you do with the therefore. Verse 12 and 13. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Okay, this is back to who is trying to influence them? Who's trying to give them this different gospel? Who's trying to tell them to follow the law religiously? But what what we see in here is a mention of circumcision, which was an important thing for God's people. It was an important thing for for the Jews. And circumcision wasn't necessary from a uh, health perspective, even though people would have told you that 50 years ago. It wasn't necessary for any other reason than the fact that it made the Jews different than the Gentiles. So it was a mark of distinction. Marks of distinction are a good thing. It's important that people know who we are and what makes us different than them or the same as them. Do you have a mark of a distinction? Holy Spirit. Mm, that's a good, good, healthy answer. Some people wear a cross around their neck. Say, that's my mark of distinction. I'm one of them. Uh, Judy, my wife, loves to wear a cross and a... Uh, oh, my God, i got to forget the name now. It's a little Jewish... No, not a dark star. It's a little thing that holds the scroll with the scripture in it. No, nice try. <laughs> mezuzah, mezuzah. These are the things they put on the door. The door frames, you often see them on door frames. So I don't, I don't think she does this to make it her mark of distinction. But some people would. They'd say, oh, I'm a Christian or I'm a Christian who loves Jews or whatever it might be. It's, it's something that we do that is an outward sign. Another symbol that some people use is the, the fish. You put a fish on your bumper or on, uh, on your Bible or things like this. These are not bad things, incidentally. We just need to make sure that they're more than superficial, which they tend to be in so many people's cases. Maybe you wear a T-shirt that says, uh, Jesus loves me or something that's not bad, but you may have it as your mark as a distinction. Well, are these kind of things the true mark of distinction that, the, that God's word wants us to have? Not really, they're pretty superficial. The mark of distinction that he wants us to have and experience and show is the character of Jesus Christ. The character of Jesus Christ can be depicted so well by this book, chapter five, verses 22 and 23, which Bob was relating as the the fruit of the spirit. The fact that if we live in those fruit of the spirit, then That's our mark of distinction. That's what makes us different. To have joy in the midst of the pandemic. That's what makes us different. People are fearful. People are hiding. People are cloistered or isolated. You know, they are, they're they're worried. They, They tend to fear man or fear a virus instead of fearing God. So we have joy. That's a mark of distinction. Now, there are how many, 
How many fruit of the Spirit are listed here? Anybody know? Nine or ten, something like that. And I bet you could add or add some if you wanted to that come out in some other parts of the Scripture. But as you look at them, all of us have limitations on how much of them we are demonstrating. Now, you don't have to work to grow the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit results because of the Spirit, not because of you. But we all live at a different place in our walk in Jesus Christ. And you may have a problem with, let's just pick one, anger. And if you do, I'm really ticked with you. <laughs> if, you've, if you have a problem with anger, for example, then you're not demonstrating a fruit of the Spirit. Does that mean that you're not a Christian? I don't think so. I think what it means is that you're, you're a work in progress. And you need to give that work of the flesh over to the Holy Spirit so that it become a work of the Spirit. And we need to grow in that. The next thing he tells us is that in verses 14 is that, uh, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. This is Paul's personal testimony, but it's one that we ought to be able to share. We ought to say the same thing, that we've been crucified in Christ and we're boasting in the cross. How can you boast in something so awful as a place of shame, as a place of bloodshed, as a place of such torture for the Son of God? Well, you can. Number one, you can boast in the cross because you are saved by the cross. Without the cross, we're lost. It's the cross of Jesus Christ that, where he gave the ultimate sacrifice, the perfect, the only one ever perfect sacrifice for us, never to have to be given again so that we can have eternal life. Secondly, we can boast because we are gifted because of the cross. Everything you have as a Christian, everything you have that's a, an ability in your life is because Jesus died on the cross for you. You wouldn't have it otherwise. Thirdly, I love because God first loved me. It isn't because we are loving people. Oh, I just love you <laughs> to death. It's because God loved us first and he gave his son to die for our sins. And that's what makes us able to love others and love each other in here and outside as well. In verse 15, for in Christ Jesus, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. So it isn't that physical mark of distinction that they had in the Jewish communities that makes you who you are. It's the fruit of the Spirit that makes you who you are. We are a new creation. And we're not a new creation in the law. We're a new creation in faith and in grace. It's by God's grace that we are who we are. You are not an old being clinging to the law. So again, he's trying to tell these people, don't, don't pay attention to this other gospel that these folks are trying to give you. And then verse 16, which is our last verse for this morning. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So it's a message to Israel, but it's also a message to all of us, which says that mercy and peace will be on us if we follow what he's saying. Therefore, if we live in the fruit of the Spirit, then we will have mercy and peace. So you see the logic as he goes through here. What are you here for? What are you here for? Is it to be a law abider? Is it to live a holy life, free from sin and full of righteousness? Not bad things, are they? It's a good thing to follow the law, but not to be so consumed by the law that you believe that's going to save your soul. So perhaps it's true that we should be those things. Matter of fact, I would highly recommend it. But what Paul is teaching us here is that we are to be doing for others. It's not about us as individuals so much as it is about us as part of 
the church. And it's not just the church that meets in this building. As we do for others, they will also do for us. You know, if we're all following the standard, then we're all taking care of each other. We're all doing our part. And then life here will be what we really want as a person. You know, you think about it. If I, I want to do for me, 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 okay? I'm not going to worry about anybody else. And everybody else has that same attitude. Then I'm not going to be satisfied from what they should be doing for me. So we need to be taking care of others and let them take care of me and us. And then we all work together through this life in Jesus Christ. And by doing this, then we do demonstrate to non-believers that it's highly desirable, both as an individual and corporately, to have a Christian lifestyle. This will draw them to Jesus and eternal life. So it's not just about us individually. It's not just about us as a body, but it's about us drawing others to Jesus Christ. Okay? So what has God called you to do? What is it in, in your life or in your gifting that he's asking you to do? Is it praying? A lot of us are prayers. Is it giving? Many of you are givers. Is it going? Some of you have gone out and been missionaries or have been places where God has used you that are outside your comfort zone. Right, Steve? Is it hospitality? It's where you draw people in and you treat them well, give them a meal or a place to stay or just greet them and be pleasant with them and make them so feel comfortable? Is it witnessing? Is it going out and sharing your personal life experience with other, others to let them know what Jesus has done in your life? Is it practical helps? Things like the food closet or the firewood ministry or other areas of our church body um, functions. Whatever it is, don't let your talent go to waste. You remember the story of the talents? You had the one who was given quite a number of them, one about half that much and one only one talent. And one one talent didn't use it and lost it as a result. That tends to be our problem from time to time as we think, well, I just have this one little thing I can do and I guess I won't do it. So my concluding comment to you is if, if you aren't here to serve others, why are you here? Why are you here? If you're not here to serve others, why didn't God just take you home the moment you were born again? We're here for a purpose. So because of all of these functions, all the things that, God, that Paul has taught us through God's word, the things that we're to do, and we're to serve others, especially within the community of Jesus Christ, we have a purpose. And we need to follow that purpose. Therefore, go and do good. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that you teach us, that you desire for us your best, that you desire for us personal, individual, holy lives, that you desire for us corporately, a life together which serves the body and serves others who need to know you. Thank you, Lord that there are unsaved who need your word and that you desire for us to share our lives with them, whether it be a smile or a word or an action. We pray, God, that you use us. Use us to accomplish your purposes individually and corporately. And we'll give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.